Hi and welcome to Climate Action Week. Um, this is the session on measuring your climate action and your climate impact in international education. Um, for those of you who are expecting to see Paul Loftus on the call, I'm very sorry, um, you'll have to make do with myself. Um, Paul was unable to join us at last minute. So um, my name is Debs McAllister. I am the Canny um, Vice President on the Global Board. Um, I also work for Universe Health 21 as a project manager. Um, and I will be chairing this session um, along with having some contributions from Will Archer, uh, who was the co-founder of the International Education Sustainability Group, and CJ Tremblay, who is the founder and managing director of Alethea Global Cooperative. So let me just admit a few more people into the room um, and we will continue with a little introduction about Canny. So um, Canny it was founded back in late 2019. Um, for those of you who don't know, Canny's vision is for a reimagined international education sector that reaches net zero emissions by 2030. Um, we are volunteer run. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the global board. Um, we have a number of regional chapters and working groups to execute our mission and our vision. Moving on, uh, we have been really successful in growing the organisation over the last um, kind of four years. Um, we have practitioners from, 100, uh, from 750 institutions globally who are now members of CANI. Um, we have been um, put up for a number of awards, as you'll see on the screen there, um, and we're really keen to uh, progress this work. How do we do that? Through our volunteer network. So if you are interested in what you hear today, if you don't know anything about Canny and you'd like to find out more and get involved, please um, join Canny. You can go to canny.org forward slash join um, and that will provide you with the information you need in order to join one of our um, regional chapters or get involved. So a big thank you to our sponsors for Climate Action Week 2024. Um, it's fantastic to have the University of Tasmania, um, who were the first university in Australia to sign the Canny Accord. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Canny Accord um, in a moment. I'm just going to, again, check out my multitasking skills and hopefully share with you a brief video. I feel about the sustainability agenda. Passionate but impatient. As fast as we go, we've always got to be going faster. My colleagues are doing remarkable things, but every time we do a remarkable thing, I know we've got to do more because we have to solve this now. The University of Tasmania has a very clear, holistic sustainability agenda. We have embedded it into our overall strategic plan for the university. It has its own framework for sustainability that encompasses four main areas of activity that are to be taken into account in all of our decision making and activities. The projects we choose always deliver additional environmental and social co-benefits, for example, biodiversity protection, for the creation of jobs for local communities. Thanks to the University of Tasmania. Oh, here we go. I've definitely um, not been successful in my multitasking. Um, and secondly, thank you to um, our other sponsor, Alethea Global Cooperative, for making this week possible. As I mentioned earlier, we have CJ Tremblay from Alethea Global with us today, um, and she's going to be talking to you more about them and what they do. So I won't say too much here, um, but they are a worker cooperative, um, and CJ will tell you more about, about that later. So I'm just going to um, hand over to Will Archer, who is going to talk to us about the International Education Sustainability Group. Um, I just stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Debs. I'm and hello everybody. I'm just going to um share my screen. Let me do that now. Here we are. Uh, 
Let me just check that's sharing. Right, hopefully you can see a PowerPoint deck. Yep. And I'll just uh, project those slides. Beginning to project now. There you go. Right, yes. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good early morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, on this on the, the theme of today's uh, webinar of measuring your climate impact in international education and specifically introducing the Climate Action Barometer uh, as a, a process and a study that uh, we've been engaged in for the past year or so, uh, looking at how to drive change in, in international education uh, in a positive way. Uh, so a bit of context, first of all. Um, we, we know that international education is a force for good. Uh, but there is also obviously the associated inevitable cost in terms of uh, the cost of the climate and in terms of emissions. Uh, but there is the great work that's being done across the sector, um, not just in educating internationally, but in collaboration in playing uh, an active role in addressing the crisis. Um, so change is possible. And what we're looking at is how, uh, how best to achieve that. Uh, we, I think we all know well the state of the climate um, in this group, um, but it's the context of international education and the climate crisis that brought us together uh, to create the International Education Sustainability Group. So we see international as a force for good. We deliver comparative insights to drive climate action. And our vision is to see an international education sector that thrives at the same time considering and mitigating its climate impact and to help universities and education providers to make better decisions around climate action, to learn from and share examples of great practice, and most importantly, to demonstrate not just a commitment to climate action, but evidence of how that is then translated into action uh, and demonstrating the comparative impact of changes against indices of peer institutions over time, with the thinking that by measuring and comparing, it can drive positive change faster. Uh, so this is us. Many of you will know Elsa Lamont very well. Uh, Elsa is our, our um, co-founder and uh, Climate Action Supremo. Uh, Emily O'Callaghan, who's appearing later tonight uh, on the next one on the next version of this of this session, uh, and myself. My background is in um, comparative international studies in in in, in education um, around the world. And then we have a great team with us: John Crick, who may well be on this call. My colleague in the UK, uh, Ivan Hasjim, driving the analytics. Esther Johnson, who uh, created the uh, EAUC um, uh, tool for measuring international emissions from uh, student travel, and has now been applying that to achieve a global common measure with us. Uh, and then Eric Meister, uh, my colleague and partner in Europe for this work. Um, and we have to thank our Founders group of uh, institutions, including the University of Tasmania, one of uh, this one of this week's sponsors. Um, it was these institutions coming together and saying there is a challenge to measure what we're doing around climate action uh, in international, and we might not know the answer, but by getting our heads together, perhaps we can find a better way of driving change faster and being able to measure what we're doing. Um, with the with the thinking that where great institutions like these lead, uh, then others will follow. So what is the Climate Action Barometer? It's a rolling global benchmark. It's a study that's tracking and comparing sustainability policies, practices, and emissions for international education, and most specifically across time. So it is, it is as things stand, the only climate benchmark tool specifically for the international education sector. So it's cross-sector comparative. It's measuring climate action across in international education, driving decision-making, tracking changes, and comparing policies and practices, emissions and remediations. So it's a continuous cycle of improvement from benchmarking, measuring the footprint, reducing it, educating and influencing and setting roadmap and targets before then um, benchmarking again and comparing uh, progress against others that are in the uh, comparator group. In terms of the scope and structure, what we've tried to look at is as much as possible, the, the component parts of international education um, and those are listed here. And so there are sections of the study that address each of these um, and about 120 measures in all. Uh, so some are measuring emissions around incoming international student travel, international operation staff travel, uh, and 
um, learning abroad, student exchange and study abroad. And then others are more particularly focusing on policies and practices and what people are doing and where are the examples of great practice that can be shared. Uh, so for staff engagement, we're looking at staff participation in climate action and mechanisms for them to collaborate and approaches to staff climate literacy for students, where it's clearly becoming increasingly important to them uh, to know what their institution is doing around uh, in terms of its environmental commitment. Uh, we're, we're looking at, as you can see here, awareness of student sentiment, eco-anxiety levels, tracking of student climate literacy and opportunities for student participation and in initiatives around climate action. Um, marketing and recruitment, looking at what's being done around marketing and publications, working with agents and sustainable practices. Uh, and then, as you can see here, the, the categorizes, ca categories around student exchange and study abroad. Uh, t and &E is the sector where we've been asked by a number of universities to expand the, the work that we're doing there to understand better how policies and practices differ between partner institutions around the world. Uh, and then we also look at sexual engagement and collaboration uh, with a special uh, look at adoption of the Caddy Accord and not just whether institutions have signed up yet, but how ready they are, what, what is their readiness to, to join in. Uh, and so the way that that's then tr transferred back to the institution is those international comparative benchmarks, a comprehensive report uh, and plus a summary too, um, the climate eye emissions tracking and then we think possibly most important of all the great the, the, the great practice exchanges and being able to assemble as many examples as possible of great practice and being able to share them across the group. Although the institution specific findings are confidential to each institution, the great practice is most typically shared shared between all. Uh, and typically we find from the pilot study in Australia and New Zealand, there's around 50 or so institution specific recommendations for each each institution. So a few key findings, where we got to with the, the study in its first pilot wave. Um, I've got about five or six findings for you to share and uh, then on to the next steps. So sustainability and climate action are core to the strategy and positioning of eight out of nine, the nine institutions in the pilot. But in most cases, that strategy is, the international strategy is not closely linked to the sustainability strategy. And uh, so, the founders group members are early stages of developing uh, climate action strategies that are specific to international operations. But almost all recognize and anticipate that climate change will have a significant impact on their international operations in the, in the few years ahead. Uh, so, and while policies and practices are not typically well embedded across international operations, uh, most, international, um, most international teams say that they're early on in the, in the start of their climate action journey, uh, despite the fact that some of them having some of the best examples of initiatives and, and policies and practices in place already, it's still a feeling, a sense across the group that we are at our early stages of uh, the climate action journey. Uh, so at the institution level, there's a general commitment to environmental sustainability. Um, as you can see there, 100% uh, commitment to sustainability at the institution level. Uh, and the importance of it at the institution level is generally very, very important. But it's when you look at the international level that we see that we are at these at this very early stage. So not having a sustainability strategy or a climate action plan for international uh, and early stages around emissions reduction targets too. Uh, in terms of the impact across the group, uh, four years is the average time until climate change is expected to impact international operations, but there are some who will say it's very definitely impacted already here, here, here and now. And the challenges that uh, typically the universities are finding is a lack of staff time and resources uh, around climate action in international, no set targets, and previously a lack of clear metrics, although clearly this process is designed to provide some of those metrics to help to drive positive change. And then the ways in which this is presented back uh, in this example, you've got a, uh, the light green being the comparator index and the dark green being an example of one university being able to see where they're, to what extent they're ahead of the group. And in this case, ahead in, in all of those uh, broad categories. Uh, and then in the end, it boils down to what is an, where, where is an institution overall? And then looking at from within, from that, going through to sector level and then into the individual uh, categorizations 
um, with the example here of action being needed against the pilot group average, and you can see the dots representing the positioning of the of those um, uh, of those institutions, just as an indi in, in indication of how visually things are reported back. Um, I've mentioned briefly the climate eye. This is the um, work that Estrid Johnson has been leading. Uh, and what we're measuring is emissions from staff and student travel, travel policies and reporting and targets. Uh, and um, the idea is to, to achieve a common measure uh, that can, that's comparable across markets and across, uh, across the globe. And we'll end up with indicators like this, uh, looking at international enrollments as a percentage of the overall emissions, uh, taking into account transnational education, outbound student travel, inbound student travel and staff travel. So in terms of next steps, uh, it is an ongoing learning process. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're all on that climate journey, including in the work that we're doing together here. Uh, so there's an annual cycle of review and sharing and target setting, recognizing that small changes can make a big difference when benchmarking and recognizing that we need to get started now. It's, it's not worth waiting a year or two to see whether we could be doing more, um, but we need to make a start now and then to be able to review and see the impact of what we're doing and the targets that we're setting and the policies and practices that we're changing. Uh, so in terms of how that plays out in this, in this calendar year, uh, we are assembling now this, expanding this global uh, group for the study and there's a data consultation and refinement process that begins after Easter uh, and then the live data collection runs through April, from April to July, um, which means uh, these institutions are some of those that are joining that global group. Uh, and we'd obviously encourage any of you who are interested to ask us more about it. It would be great to welcome more universities in at this, uh, to this first global wave. Uh, and aside from that, just to say thank you to our pioneers um, and the leadership that they are showing in uh, taking forward this study and the work that we're doing. Finishing with the, uh, the thing we all know, I guess, that the, what the KPI that really counts is that 1.5 degrees. Uh, and a reminder that we see international education as a force for good. And what we're doing is delivering comparative insights to drive climate action. And I, my contact details are up on the top of the screen there now. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Will. Um, that's great to hear. Um, I have a quick question for you before we, we move on to CJ. Um, and I just wondered, you know, with your pilot group, have you delivered any of those um, kind of responses back to the institutions? And what has the impact? Have you seen that impact? Have you seen any kind of tangible results for those institutions yet? Or have you yes, so, the so all of the um, all of the founders group members uh, have uh, have their findings now. Um, and what's been interesting is even in the course of the study itself that we found um, we found that there are changes that are being made because some of the questions that we'll be asking people would have said people have responded we never thought of that before we never thought of we, we never thought of doing that before and so even in the process of, of finding some questions that we can't answer that a university is unable to answer they're now changing so that they'll be able to answer for the next cycle of the study so that in itself just as part of the process we found has um, been driving change and then yes we're we're collating now ahead of this sec of this global wave examples of some of the great initiatives that are being taken um, on the back of those detailed findings that have been shared now. Brilliant, thank you. Um, thank and you. we just have another sorry, we just have another question um, in the chat from Morgan Johnson asking, does the CAB rely solely on self-reported institutional data? Uh, yes, it does. And the one one of the first questions we had about that was, well, maybe people would. Um, uh, misreport and they, they make themselves better than they are but it's a benchmarking process it's it's the opposite of a ranking it's how we learn from each other and so in fact we found the opposite um typically true where people have said well we might have we might have examples of this but we're there's there's not a clear policy on it so we've said we said we're doing nothing although we're doing a bit uh it's so um it's yes there's no benefit so hopefully it makes sense that it's it's self-reported the other point to make though is that it's self-reported but the target is for each institution to have for it to take only a day and a half of somebody's time um, and for us to do the vast majority of the work and, and the, the making sense of the data brilliant thank you well um let's hand over to cj um thanks so much for being with us today cj i'm going to ask you to present your slides and talk about alethea global okay perfect thank you so much 
Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is CJ Tromley, and I'm so happy to be attending. I was saying earlier, this is my second virtual conference in a month, and I love that that um, continues to happen. So before I share um, some slides, I just want to share a little bit. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Aletheia Global Cooperative, and I would invite anyone, um, you know, this is the canny network. I'd invite anyone, if you're feeling like you want to, to turn on those cameras. I will share my slides in a little bit, but our approach generally is very human and human centric. Uh, and so I have talked to many screens before, um, but seeing faces, familiar ones, no less, um, is always wonderful. So a little bit about Aletheia. Um, we're a worker cooperative and sustainability consultancy that works with institutions, associations, governments, and other organizations in international education um, to really increase um, internationalization, decrease emissions, and to do so through a climate justice lens. And I would say that the mere existence of Aletheia and organizations like IESG um, as an organization in the field of international education really speaks to the drastic changes in this sector and also the climate reality we are all facing. So before I share my slides, I just want to share a little bit of an origin story of how I find myself in this um, room, a presenter of Climate Action Week um, with these other panelists and a proud sponsor of this important event. Um, and I think that that's good, likely gonna resonate and there'll be some shared truths here. <clears throat> so five years ago, I was a practitioner working for a service provider in student recruitment and English language testing. My whole job was pretty much, this might sound familiar, to go to a lot of the conferences on the global circuit. Uh, sometimes I thought traveling for work was like part of a major part of my whole personality. Um, I just finished my global MBA, which had four modules abroad in six different countries. And it had never occurred to me about the climate impact of my work or my MBA, and nobody ever brought it up. Um, I remembered being floored when my sister, who's about 14 years younger than I am, um, told me she had very real climate anxiety. So the first big conference, uh, there's all, there was always a big conference. Uh, after that, I started asking everybody that I talked to, and there's some people in this call uh, that I didn't really ask this question to, like, are you calculating your emissions? Are you budgeting for offsets? Are you sending people, fewer people to events, skipping events? I honestly didn't even know what to really ask people. Um, and nobody I talked to was thinking about it. But I really, at that point, couldn't unsee how we weren't talking about it and how it really was like a systemic omission um, on our part, like the adults in the room, um, to really consider the climate impact of the way the sector operated as a whole. And there wasn't really anyone to help. So that was in November 2019. I felt so alone and there were many a days where I felt like a little bit of a crazy person. Um, about a month later, I found the Kenny Climate Action Network for International Educators. Uh, it was still a super informal group, but I felt instantly like I found people who understood it, who got it. Um, and I became one of its founding members and super proudly uh, the inaugural VP of the board. And I just want to state super transparently, I did not know anything about climate science. I was an international education practitioner, but the pandemic then happened. Um, I saw we had the capacity for dramatic change and threw myself into like really learning as much as I could, pushing for system change, like big change at the system level to ensure we didn't just go back to how it's always been done. Um, and I couldn't be like more proud and happy about where we are today in this full circle moment being asked to present um, about <clears throat> our work and our team. So I do want to share a little bit about what we uh, do, and I want to do so um, a little bit in the, can everyone see my slides? Perfect. So I want to really focus um, first on our work is really centered in climate justice. So before we get started, it is important to acknowledge that I'm joining virtually as well as some of my colleagues here on the call um, from the 
traditional ancestral and stolen territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, this truth anchors our work every day, knowing that the people who contribute to the climate crisis the least are being currently affected by the most. And this is why our work also is part working with clients, of course, but also advocacy. So I want to share that our name, Aletheia, is actually derived from the Greek goddess um, Aletheia, meaning truth or disclosure. So it quite literally translates to the state of not being hidden, the state of being evident. So we do our work as a worker cooperative. And the nature of that business model is inherently sort of more sustainable than a typical operating structure. So instead of being beholden to like profit-driven shareholders, we're beholden to ourselves, to our mission, and to our community. And for us, our community is you, the international education sectors. And so some ways we support our community are listed there on the right, but we also work with organizations at different points in their climate justice and emissions reduction journey. I kind of just want to meet people where they are. So we'll set the scene a little bit for this as well. So, you know, when it comes to measuring in the context of this conversation, we know we need to reduce emissions. And these are the timelines set by our friends at the UN, um, the carbon law and the race to zero campaign. The Kenny Glasgow paper makes reference to this. And it really serves to rally the leadership and support from industry, business, institutions around the world, including international education. And this is such an important part of measuring, like knowing what our goals are. And this shows us that our goals are sort of a 50% reduction of emissions in each of the decades leading to 2050. Um, now, this means a reduction of 50% from our 2019 emissions, which is really like our last normal year pre-COVID by 2030. I was recently at an event there, someone reminded us it was like 70 months. Um, so that's coming. Um, but I want to note that despite that truth, I want to make sure that we're having this conversation, not in the context of stop doing everything now, but rather start planning to reduce as soon as possible so that by 2030, you're at 50% of where you were in 2019 and planning for emissions reductions is one of those ways that we sort of help and work with and support our clients in the sector. And we wanna make sure that those reductions are like with equity centered climate action in mind. Um, we believe that we maximize our impact at the intersection of our work and climate action and sustainability, as well as justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, sort of all that human rights work we've really been doing um, and leaning into the last um, several years. And I want to share our truth and how we've operationalized these goals and how our own work models, the way that we work with our clients and partners and sort of use and share with you ourselves as an example. Um, and so we separated our areas of focus to maximize our impact, which for us means um, really reducing our emissions and embedding climate justice into our work. And, but not only that, really we wanna talk about what we can do within our organization and our operations and then how we can use our work um, within this system of international education. So those sort of ones that are shaded, I'm not gonna to talk too much about those. I wanna focus on sort of these five areas um, just given our time constraints. Now, this is something that I think everyone here if you're not familiar with, Deb is going to lean into this a little bit later, but I want to share how we use the Kenny Accord. So we've anchored our internal benchmarking to the framework of the Kenny Accord, and we're committed to increasing our actions and commitments over time. So we're super proud that we've been able to not just sort of do this work for ourselves, obviously, but actually help a lot of clients and partners navigate that process of becoming signatories to the Kenny Accord as well. Some organizations require a bit more of a formal process. So this is a really excellent tool and framework um, that sort of, you know, was created for international practitioners by international practitioners. So it's really like a community-led initiative. Um, now for us, our most important commitments, in my opinion, are basically table stakes, right? And they're the ones you see here. Um, where we explicitly are talking about transforming how we work and focusing on reducing emissions. 
So starting with actions 18 and 26, which account for, talk about accounting for emissions and not limiting to just scope one and two, but looking at our sort of scope three, which include travel emissions. Um, and also action number 19 that ensures we're not leaning on offsets as a substitution to action to reduce emissions, but rather treating them as our sort of last line of defense. Action number 30 is a big one, and I'll share a bit more about that later, but the word possible is a critical word here. The, if the word is possible and not like I want to when I will like it or when I can do it without feeling like I'm missing out. Um, and that's something that we face a lot and that we work with our clients a lot. There's a lot of feelings work here. Um, just it's a because we're dealing with humans making change. Um, and lastly, action uh, number 39 really leads me to our next area of focus. So when we first started, Alethea was primarily based out of Vancouver, but we've expanded and built our team based on supporting our partners and clients internationally and attending events with the fewest emissions possible. So we added passionate and skilled team members in Europe, as well as team members who have secondary locations due to their student status or like family commitments in other regions. And that's really allowed us um, to do the following. <clears throat> so decarbonizing is key, right? This whole session is about measuring your impact and we work in reducing emissions. So we're sort of prepared to lead by example and pull back the curtain on our work. Um, so in 2019, there was no Aletheia. As I mentioned earlier, I was still deep in my feelings about feeling alone and a little bit crazy um, and had not yet found our friends at Canny. Um, so when we're looking at setting that emissions baseline based on those 50% reduction targets at the start of the decade, we were not a thing. Um, but myself and along with three of our other founding members all worked in this sector, also for service providers, and we did business the way it's always been done. So in order to establish our Aletheia emissions baseline, we used our travel when we were at our other organizations, right? We, we started Aletheia mid-pandemic. So since 2021, uh, late 2021, we've really taken a completely different approach to how we do conferences and business development, and as well as like how we work with our clients. Um, and we're able to decrease emissions more than 50 tons. So by a little over 94% from how we used to work with our previous employers. And what's really interesting is we've been able to reduce the emissions intensity of attending those events, meaning the emissions that we're using to attend events has been reduced from an average of more than like four tons per event to 0 0.5 tons per event. And this is something that we talk about on our blog at aletheia.global. So I encourage you to check it out because it's not been easy, but I also don't think that we're special here. Um, and all of it is anchored in the truth that we have to ask ourselves some hard questions, um, which we also ask of our clients and partners, and that you can also ask yourself of yourself. So hopefully that blog would shed a little bit more light on how we work. Um, but the long and short of it is we achieve this by making hard choices. Um, like for example, when there's big conferences, but it doesn't align with our values or carbon strategy, we don't participate. Um, we're making choices based on geography first when there's local opportunities and we're able to leverage our team's international locations, which I shared about earlier, so that folks can attend with lower carbon travel, such as trains. And we're also working differently than before and just changing the expectation of how we engage a lot more virtual work. For example, this is a picture of my video recorded presentation from a room full of people at the Forum on Education Abroad's annual conference in Boston. Shout out to my co-presenter, who Kay, who I think was in here, turn on her camera. Um, but this was entirely made possible because there were colleagues that I co-presented with who wanted to lead by example and show that this was possible. This was because individual actions, uh, individuals took charge really to enable system change that allowed me to present at an in-person conference virtually. And that is not common. And because of that, I was able to save, I don't know, like just shy of two tons of emissions by not attending, but we need more of that, right? So we need more of these changes to be enabled at a system level. And I really want to talk a little bit more about that, about how 
we talk so much about individual action and individual behavior, but the most impactful individual action someone can take or you and your teams can take is really action within your work, especially when that work is as reliant on emissions as our work is. And we really want to be sure from a climate justice perspective that we aren't shifting the burden onto individuals or students or mm, repeating mistakes of the past where people historically might have been included just because of access. So I want to get into a little bit about how we were able to maximize impact at a system level because I want you to think about are you in a position to advocate for more maybe virtual engagement, perhaps more resources to prioritize climate justice training or planning, and what do those power levers sort of look like for you? And for us, <clears throat> we know time is the one resource that is finding for all of us. We saw that timeline. 70 months is careening. Um, and so where are you spending your time and energy? And what we ask of our clients is where are you sort of channeling that energy? Where are your power levers to advance climate justice and decarbonize your work within your team, within your sort of organization, within the sector? And so for us, we started by choosing to work with clients and partners who can bring on system change with their influence. And we've sort of um, decided where we are going to invest time navigating bureaucracy, right? Like governments, national and international associations are a good use of time. But I also believe that we can and do, you can do both things, right? Focusing on influencing the system while we do the day-to-day -day work of keeping our emissions low, reducing those of our clients and sort of advancing for in, advocating for innovation within our client systems and our overall bigger system. So that's the kind of work we do with our clients. It's really a holistic approach to looking at the different systems they're a part of and the dynamics between them so that we can help maximize the emissions reductions impact while maintaining a commitment to internationalization. So for example, at Aletheia, turning the tables back on ourselves as ourselves as an example is we have like some sponsor, some a little bit of power um, for sponsors. So as I mentioned, we pushed for the forum on education abroad to let us sponsor specifically the virtual conference because that's what aligns with our values. Um, naturally, we support Canny uh, and we also push our, our clients. So to everyone here who's made the time to be part of this conversation, um, it's exciting to think about how in your work you can advance this and push for innovation that can be implemented um, to reduce emissions. And we're super keen to be able to walk that journey alongside our clients and partners around the sector, wherever they are in that journey. Not everyone's at the same place. Not everyone's able to take action um, at the same rate at the same time. Um, and so lastly, but perhaps a little bit more importantly, we know, for example, that money talks. So we've really followed through on supporting events that are committed to leading change, uh, provide virtual events um, that focus on climate action and really who people who meet us on our boundaries for emission strategy. I often say like, I will literally give you so much money, so much more money as a sponsor um, of something that's fully virtual or that really makes people listen to this important new dimension of our sector and not really opt out of it. And so obviously we're proud to Canny, to sponsor Canny and then Canny Climate Action Week. And for that reason, um, and where we don't participate or support other conferences, events is sort of notable. And so while system change as a whole, where we're talking about measurement might be hard to measure, it's not hard to do the sort of mm, ballpark mental math and figure out the potential of impact of large scale adaptation for innovation and transformation of our sector. And I sort of want to leave you with that where I shared earlier about how this really is like a full circle moment for Alethea was really born out of advocacy with members. So there's, I think Sarah and Mavish are in the room. Um, members really either leaving their jobs so that we could pursue in the sector so that we could pursue um, really helping people along on their climate journey, but also lead by example and be loud about it. So even though sort of we were born out of candy, we didn't lose those advocacy roots. That doesn't keep, you don't take, that doesn't go away. Um, so I would leave on the parting note that if you're not measuring your impact yet, that's okay. You can make loud commitments today. 
um, to measure it in the near future and make loud commitments to take action on reducing those emissions. But really, it does begin with measurements uh, and sort of learning from that and continuing to learn so that you can reduce those things that you're measuring um, for optimizing your impact. So while this session is really an important climate justice action that you took today, the next step is certainly more measuring and future emissions. So I just want to thank everyone for their time. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful for the space. Thanks, CJ. Um, your passion is always so refreshing um, and exciting, and you really capture a lot of what we're trying to do across the whole sector. Um, and it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful to hear your personal journey as well. Um, we, yeah, we've, we've known each other a while. There are a couple of other people on the call as well. You know, your colleague Marisha managed to meet her last week and you know she has done a fantastic job of pulling together um action week for canny last year in 2023 and we finally managed to meet in person it turns out we're both now based in the same city which is wonderful and i think some of that speaks to the, the just the value of the, the the network that we build by attending these kind of events and by reaching out and connecting with each other um and getting those sparks from each other and you know having those really difficult conversations around you know, where do I start with this and how do I progress this and leaning on each other's expertise and people who might be slightly more um, advanced in their own journey towards that, whether that's institutionally or individually. Um, and so I've really looked up to you, CJ, for all the work you've done. And I'm really pleased to be able to connect with with other people as well as we um, continue on this journey. It's something that you mentioned that really you know resonated with me, said um, we don't need to stop doing everything now, but we really need to start planning. So we meet those emission reductions. And that's something that I think is incredibly key. Um, we need to start planning and measuring and capturing what we're doing in order to change our behavior in order to see the impact. So, and, and, and also talk that story and, and, and really share that with people. So thanks again. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Uh, let's see how this goes again. And briefly talk to you about the Canny Accord. Um, if I don't start it from the beginning, but start it from here. So for those of you who don't know, um, and CJ mentioned the Canny Accord, um, this was developed um, as a response to uh, a sector-wide event where Canny brought together um, leaders from around the globe in 2021. Um, CJ referred to the Glasgow paper that was developed at the same time, and that really sets the scene and provides the context for the development of the Canny Accord. And it really articulates the, 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 the data um, and the data drive that has, that has um, really um, sparked what, what we're doing with the Canny Accord. So the Accord is, and apologies if you know the Accord and if you are a signatory to the Accord, that's fantastic. Thank you for being here. Thank you for championing it. Um, it is a public commitment um, and a menu of practical actions designed to guide the international education sector um, and, and its response to the climate crisis. Um, there are eight articles across the Accord. Um, articles one to three provides the context, so it looks at definitions, it looks at commitments and the purpose and the principles behind, behind this. It, it looks at the fact that we all agree that we need to take action as the first step and we need to do that in collaboration and we need to measure what we're doing. Um, articles four to eight include a number of different actions. There are 70 actions in total um, across these different categories around leadership and influencing. How can you use your influence locally, regionally, globally to gain traction, to help support the work that we're doing in um, reducing our impact on the climate and responding to the, the climate emergency? Um, Article 5 covers emissions, accounting and reduction. Um, Article 6 looks at travel, one of those key, key issues that we find in international education. Um, facilities, operations and procurement. We look at how you can you know, measure that, how you can look to um, really embed some climate actions in your operational strategies. Um, and it looks at education and how we are incorporating climate education within our um, an organ within organizational um, courses, um, different curriculum, um, different areas. So each 
uh, article has a number of different actions that are categorized into basic, better and best. So these jump through um, a range of kind of what, what might be achievable. The, the best practice for some might be incredibly hard to reach and might be beyond your capacity at the moment. But we hope that if you look at some of these articles, ones that you know might be in the basic and better are really, really easy to implement and to action. Um, so I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at the Canny Accord and, and look at those actions um, and what they really mean. In order to sign the accord, you need to commit to five out of the 70 actions across three of the five categories. So articles one to three are a given and you have to um, kind of commit to those. And then articles four to eight, you only need five commitments out of um, three categories. However, um, we really encourage you to just work your way through those 70. I've recently done this with my organisation, Universitas 21, and it was really interesting because it started the conversation, you know, like Will was saying, in terms of just beginning to, to look at that benchmarking, you know, it's, it enables you to review and look at what you're doing and then look at actually if you're already doing stuff in that area, that's fantastic. What can you do to increase that? What can you do to stretch that and enhance that and move through those progressive actions in, from the basic to the better to the best? So every organisation that um, signs the Canny Accord, as CJ mentioned in her um, presentation, has a, a page on the, the Canny website. Um, we have a signatory directory, and this is a public declaration of those commitments that you are making. Um, we know that a number of the student surveys, we are seeing students being more intentional and concerned with choosing where they are studying based on what that organisation is doing in their climate journey. And so this is a really good um, way for people to come and check what you're doing and for you to be held accountable by that. Each section um, has, each, each signatory has its own page. And so you can really drill down into that and have a look at, you know, oh, I wonder what Alethea Global has signed up to and, and what they're doing in the forum. Here is the example. So just to talk about the, the process, um, there is a form to fill in on, on canny.org. Um, before going through to the form, I suggest you either download the Canny Accord in a PDF and read the Glasgow paper, um, but also um, just, just work through those, those commitments. Um, you'll submit the, the online form um, that will come through to Canny. We will send you a review of those just to double check that you are committing to what you say you are going to commit to um, and that your content is correct. And then that goes up and you get listed on the signatory listing. Um, you'll be provided with a marketing toolkit and we really encourage you to um, champion your climate action and your commitment to the Canny Accord through that. Um, so that's just a brief overview of, of the Canny Accord. Um, I'm really happy to talk to anyone who would like to find out more about, about what that means for them, for their organisation. Um, and also I know there are a number of people on the call who are already signatories and or are in the process or in their own you know, undergoing their own journey around that. So I just want to um, open up for, for questions, really, um, before we uh, wrap up this session. So if you are interested in asking a question of Will, of CJ, of myself, please pop it in the chat or use the hand raise function or turn your camera on and wave madly at me. Um, feel free to ask any questions of us around what we've been discussing today or share any examples of how you are, um, you know, measuring your climate impact. Okay, I am very comfortable with uh, awkward silences while people figure out their uh, question, but I just wanted to um, flag that um, we're obviously huge supporters of the Canyon Accord, um, and some organizations just have like freewheeling flexibility of doing it on uh, their own, um, and we have had some clients who like need a full report with like recommendations and timelines and road mapping so that is like it can depending on like you can absolutely sort of motor through that yourself there's a ton of signatories who will talk you through it the canny americas chapter is having a meeting on thursday and you're gonna hear from us uh then on how to sign it but if there's ever like a need for something more formal that's certainly something like whether it's a handful of 
um, discussions to help people navigate the process of becoming a signatory or just like actually like my board needs a formal thing that we need to read and vote on, then that's also something that we can um, help with specifically on the Canyon Court. So I just wanted to share that in case anyone, in case that's useful. Thanks, Jay. Um, any questions popping up? Hi, Stephen. Do you want to unmute Hi. Hi. Um, thanks. Thanks for the presentation, CJ and Will. Very, very interesting. I, I just wanted to point out that it's not always easy to get your institution to sign the Canny Accord. Um, I've I've been trying to get my institution to sign it for two or three years. Um, uh, so I, I uh, run a study abroad campus in Dublin, Ireland for a U.S. institution based in Vermont. And part of the challenge there is I'm this lone person. We have a very small international office. I'm this lone person sitting out in Ireland trying to do the right thing, trying to make our programs more sustainable and climate aware. Yeah, the head office just doesn't get it. And put it in front of the president and the provost and they're like, why would we do this? So, you know, you can do all the persuading, but sometimes it just doesn't work. And then you got, you got to roll with it. So I've just sort of said, well, I run the Dublin campus. So you know what, we'll do whatever we can without signing, without signing the accord. We'll still implement as many of these um, pledges as possible. So. That's brilliant. Um, it's interesting you raised that because I used to work at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and we were in the process of developing a sustain, uh, you know, university-wide sustainability strategy. Um, and as the international office, we took the opportunity to sign up to the accord as the University of Auckland International Office. So that is also possible. Um, we then were able to integrate that, and we used it to um, what's the what's the term? The tail that wags the dog. Um, so that you know, really help and guide and drive. Some of the conversations that were being happening um, across the institution. So, um, you know, there are there are completely different ways to approach this, and I really appreciate the way that you are progressing with your commitments, um, even without the support of your um, in, in institution. It's great to see. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, I will briefly just say thank you ever so much for joining us today. It's been fantastic to have you all on the call. Um, as I mentioned to, before, Canny is a grassroots volunteer-led and run organisation. We are non-profit, um, but we do have costs to keep the virtual lights on um, and to run events such as these. So if you're interested in making a contribution to the work of Canny, um, please do. And just to mention that the rest of this week is flying by. Um, we have a couple of extra presentations today, depending on what location you are in. Um, and the chapter meetings, the regional chapter meetings are taking place uh, on Thursday across the world. If you're interested, go to the Canny website and sign up for one of those. The chapters are a great opportunity to connect locally um, and really, really build that network and, and really lean into to the support um, and the inspiration that you get from, from the group. So um, my final thanks to CJ and to Will for giving me and us your time today. Thanks for the great work you are doing. Thanks to everyone for turning up um, and really hope to see you soon. Also, please reach out to any of us if you'd like to find out more about what we're doing with Alethea Global, with IESG or with Canny. Uh, take care, have a wonderful day, and you have a few minutes left back of your hour. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Thank you.